everybody, and welcome to Lifehacker. Uh, if you're familiar with our show, we're doing a little bit of a different format today. It's going to be more of a question and answer format, similar to the Ask Lifehacker series on the site. So it's a way for us to have a little more interactive uh, conversation with the readers and answer specific questions you have and sort of try and help out with specific things. Does that sound about right to you guys? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so I'm here with Whitson and Adam. Hello. And I'm Adam Pash. Um, so let's just dive right into it. Uh, reader Piss Poor Partition Planner wrote in, Two years ago I bought a MacBook Pro and installed Windows 7 on it the following week to dual boot. Since then I've used Mac OS X only a dozen times or so. The problem is that I've allowed only 40 gigabytes of space for Windows 7 out of the 320 gigabytes of the hard drive and thus am stuck with constant low space error messages and other malfunctions due to lack of space. Is there a way I can reassign drive space without having to format, reinstall, or any other drastic measures? Well, Whitson, yeah. <laughs> you have... This is a page right out of my life. You have a MacBook Pro Not... that you have windows on uh-huh. and have been doing for quite some time now. And I had this exact problem because I did not expect to use Windows as much as I now do. I don't, yeah, now you don't even have I don't, OS 10 on it. I either, don't. I barely put into OS 10, but I have the same problem, and unfortunately, the answer is there really is no easy way to do it. You can resize your Mac partition from OS 10, and I think you can resize your Windows partition from Windows, but you can only resize the end of the partition. So there's no real way to make the OS 10 partition smaller and then move the Windows partition. The, the best way to do it is probably going to be to get an, ex- an external drive for your computer that can hold your entire Windows partition, which I think you said was only 40 gigs, so that should be easy to find. Um, use something like CloneZilla um, or the ESUS Partition Manager. Any Partition Manager should be fine to clone that entire partition onto your external drive, format your drive, resize your OS 10 partition, and then restore the cloned partition from your external drive back onto your MacBook. It sounds horrible, it's not really that bad. It'll, it'll take a while. You know, you'll need to you'll let it sit for an hour or two while it does all of that. But um, if you do everything right, you should be able to just boot right back into Windows. You might have to repair a bootloader. We've done quite a few posts on this, and so I can link to some of those in the show notes. So the answer is no. The answer yeah. is no, is but there is a way to do it. That, there is a way to do it without reinstalling Windows from scratch. So yeah. there is a drawn-out process, but you can at least keep all of your data, and yeah. that is nice. Good excuse to catch up on TV. Too. And yes, I had yeah, I've caught up <laughs> on many a TV show this way. All right, um, reader dazed and confused writes, "What's the best survey tool out there? There are so many options, uh, blah blah blah, and many many more. <laughs> I'm sure they all have their pros and cons. I just want something easy, flexible, and cheap, if not free. So I don't know. We we've used. I don't know what the best one is. Frankly, I haven't used. I don't know half of them that this." Well, Dazed and Confused has described, but um, on well, the site... Google Forms was on there, but... Oh, Google yeah, Forms yeah. was one of them. So on the site, on Lifehacker, we use Poll Daddy, and I believe Poll Daddy probably has free accounts. I think that they um, our... They do. And I think that our, our company pays for... Uh, Gawker Media pays for uh, premium accounts for us. But um, but if you've seen our reader polls on the sites, we're using Poll Daddy. Those are all powered by Poll Daddy. And they can look much better than they currently do right now. They do. The, <laughs> The, we the take designs been terrible advantage of of the pull daddy pulls. They're hardly hardly being used um, to their full effect. However, um, Google Docs uh, has forms inside Google Docs, and they actually we just started using these a lot more. Yeah, well, we Adam did it for that post. Yeah, for the the uh, secret gift guide. Yes. Or the secret, like if you want to make a gift list for for uh, your want list for people, yeah. uh, but you don't want them, you want them to be able to manage it, but not know what uh, what's actually on it. We also also use them for our internal uh, site evaluations, oh, yeah. writer oh, and editor evaluations. Um, but they're actually they're really really useful. They're actually pretty simple to set up. You yeah, just, like five I mean, seconds. It takes no time to wrap your head around it, and you've actually got a really useful uh, poll that you can you can embed them too, can't you? I don't know. I'm actually pretty sure you can. What's that would be. I, I have, no, have something to say. No, I imagine me shaking my head because I have no extensive knowledge on this subject. That would be great if it's possible, though. Excellent. I do think they are embeddable. Um, and you can do much more on the... Like, the, the Google Forms, you can... you can The replies can be multiple choice. Um, Poll Daddy, they're, like, pretty... 
I don't think you can do a whole form in the same way you can with like Google mm. Docs. Um, no, Google Docs can have like multi question and answer, and the questions can be like short input boxes, larger text areas, um, radio buttons, multiple choice. It's much better for something marks. detailed, where it's so full daddy, like something big... for like something simple but that looks really good. Exactly. Yeah. Kevin writes, I have a basic understanding of C, and I just finished two semesters of Java. Rather than take more classes, I would like to join some community open source projects. I've heard of GitHub and SourceForge, but I have no idea how these sites work, nor how to dive in and get started. Um, okay, so great question. Um, for those of you who don't know, GitHub and SourceForge are both um, open source public repositories for um, open source co code. Um, a lot of great open source projects have been hosted on both of them. SourceForge is a bit of a dinosaur at this point, unfortunately. Um, I'm sure there's still great stuff hosted on SourceForge, but almost every project I know that's really active and good has moved to GitHub. Um, so to get started with GitHub, you have to wrap your head around Git, which is a reversion, revision uh, control system. Um, and there's Subversion is an old one, is like the, Git's actually very old too. Anyway, Git's super popular now. That's what you need to know. Tons of people love it. GitHub is a great social network for sharing and forking and merging code among a lot of people. So my advice would be go to GitHub, sign up for an account, read through their introductory stuff on how Git works, and then find an open source project that you're into, um, and then just get involved with the community. You can, um, you can pull down all the code, you can play around with stuff, you can try and add your own tweaks to it, and then you could submit a pull request to the person who owns that, the main repository. And before you know it, you'll be participating in this awesome open source community. I mean, we even have a few projects on GitHub, don't we? We do. Um, yeah. I mean, your yeah, my... About Me page, or Life Hacker Me, is that yeah, what you Yeah, whatever. <laughs> the, whatever it was. Um, the the personal, personal landing page, page yeah. yeah, it's on there. Um, yeah, I've you, have got, you have a couple. I've got, I think... I'd love it if you're interested in playing with uh, Texter, <laughs> our text replacement application. I've been dying for years for someone to take over development of it because it's been kind of um, stagnant for years. Um, Belvedere oh, is on it, the automated it. file manager that, that I first developed and now is being actively developed by a Lifehacker reader, Matt Shorts. Um, I think my Google Music extension is on it. Every, I, I, pretty much everything I make right now that we put on the site is on GitHub. So. Um, if you go to github.com slash Adam Pash, I think, uh, you can check mine out and <laughs> contribute to mine. No, I'm not the best example of a thriving open source community because most of them are just there and hopefully you can do something with them. Um, so yeah, good luck with that, Kevin. Um, okay, Antonio writes, I successfully created my home FTP server with FileZilla and I can now access it from my laptop and phone. However, it's only I can only access it while I'm in my local network. Uh, Antonio then goes on to explain that he's having trouble accessing his FTP server from outside his home network, and he's looking for a way to make that happen. Uh, he gave us a lot of details on sort of what the setup's like. Basically, uh, if you don't know, FileZilla is an FTP program uh, for Windows. It's our favorite FTP program for our Windows. Our favorite. Fact. FTP program for Windows, and it can set up a, an FTP server on your Windows computer so that you can FTP into your computer and access files that are on your public FTP directories um, from anywhere. It sounds like the most likely thing happening in um, Antonio's case is that he does not have the proper port forwarding set up so that when his computer from outside the network is trying to access his computer inside his home network, it's not. It's blocking what's most likely port twenty one. Yeah. Port twenty one. <laughs> unless, well, unless that's the SFTP, default. Which is the default. The default FTP server is uh, twenty one. Default and SFTP is twenty two. Um, but basically, it's like here's your here's your Thanks. computer <laughs> on someone's at Starbucks, and here's your computer um, on your home network, and your computer from Starbucks. This is say your router. Which is hooked up to your yeah. well for the mode. for the people who are actually watching this. There's a glass of water on the right of the computer <laughs> in the middle. You've got two glasses of water. You're not getting this glass at all. Of water on the left. Anyway, your outside computer gets your server's address, your home mm -hmm. server's uh, IP address, and it, it, it hits up your home 
uh, router, where it hits your modem, which then goes to your router. And then your router has a, um, what's it called? Port. What's a firewall? Your router has a hardware <laughs> firewall built into it. Um, and that firewall says what ports uh, can be accessed on any computer in your network. And then, in this case, what's happening is probably your outside computer is coming into it and says, I want port 20 on this computer at, on your home. Yeah! <laughs> port 21. This computer on your home. And basically, your router's like, no, you can't access that. I'm protecting that computer yeah. from that port. So you have to go into your router, um, log in, and set up port 21. Mm -hmm. uh, to forward to that computer. Yeah, to the IP address, the local IP address of that computer. And we actually have... Um, a Adam whole, has done an well, extensive well, guide. Well, we have, a, we have a whole night school on configuring your routers, and I believe it's post number four is port, port forwarding. So if you go to lifehacker.com slash night school slash routers, that should give you uh, the entire list of those lessons. Go to number four. And you can read up on port forwarding there. We'll also include yes. a link. And we'll put a link notes. in the show yeah. notes. Yeah. Um, but that whole night school is definitely worth reading. Yeah, Networking right. is one of those things that mm. we kind of all wish we got or knew more about and sometimes just don't. And there's mm. a lot of really good stuff in there. Yes. Yeah. My, I mean, like you, you should probably say. Witson's up. never port forwarded, forwarded in his life. He's still never port forwarded. Yeah. For what it's worth, though, um, Antonio, keep in mind that even if you open a port on your local computer, like with Windows Firewall, say you have Windows Firewall enabled and you've, and you've opened port 21, um, you still... Will ha you'll still normally need to go into your router's um, config and open 21 to forward it over to your computer. Mm. Oh, you know, one other thing we should probably mention is if any Mac users want to do this on, uh, I mean, they, they want to have an FTP server on their computer, uh, configuring an FTP server on the Mac is really, really easy to do. I don't remember in, exactly right? where it is. It is built in. You go into the system sharing, preferences, the sharing, 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 sharing that's the one, yeah. And you just tick a checkbox. That, that said, says, I do believe FileZilla is also well, available for Mac. Is that true? It's it, Okay, so it's in sharing, file sharing. Oh, wait, no, is it? Yeah. File sharing. File I think sharing. file sharing is And then you FTP click on options. There you and, go. Wait, now this is AFP and, and Samba. Samba. Um, where is FTP? What happened to it? I don't know, is this some lion it's nonsense? Lion, this is lion. Anyway, I'm fairly <laughs> certain that FileZilla also exists for Mac, upgraded. and it gives you more options than you would ever even know what to do with. So if you want to set an FTP server, FTP? that is probably a great way to do it. Um, How did they get rid of FTP? That's terrible. How do we not know that? I, I don't Because I it. haven't upgraded <laughs> to lion. Anyway. Wait. Oh, dear. Um, Wait a minute. No, you're not. Well, we can, yeah, we can. We can mourn this. We later. can move on. Yeah, this is sad. I didn't I had no idea this happened. Apple, thumbs down. Adam's crying on the inside. Okay, I'm gonna be crying on the outside later. Reader Jason writes, "What is the best way to get Siri on a jailbroken iPhone 4 or other device?" I'm gonna throw this one right over to Adam. <laughs> um, there's not a good way. There's there is a way. Um, the the problem with uh, with putting Siri on your um, on your iPhone is that if you do that, you still have to you, you still have to it has to go through this kind of um, what is it the the it has to be authorized yeah. by an iPhone four um, it has to have an authentication token and an iPhone four S well, four S yeah sorry and and to, you know in order to do that you need to, you either need to have someone spoofing it which is complicated and or you have to um, have the authentic authentication token um, from another iPhone 4s which is also a pain in the butt unless you have an iPhone 4s or know somebody with an iPhone 4s um, so there's really not a good way to do it but you can download it um, from the from the city app store you can actually download a full port of Siri you just need to be able to have that authentication token we have a, a link um, and we'll have a link in the show notes that actually describes how to do this uh, if you really want to go through the trouble, but we'd recommend letting it go for the time being because it's just a very tedious process that can't be done um, in any good way, at least legally. So if I've got, if I, because I have an iPhone 4S, if I have my mm. iPhone 4S and I grab my auth token from my 4S, could yeah. I then take an iPhone, f like any, yeah, does, you does give it me have a problem with token. multiple devices using no. the same auth token? No. So why isn't there just one guy who's like, I bought this iPhone. You know, I don't. Here you go, world. <laughs> Here's my love token. 
Um, I would think that I think that if someone probably did that, it would be the same way as like if you have serial numbers floating around. Sure. They work for sure, yeah. ten people, but then as soon as you know Apple or whoever gets wind of this thing being used again and again and again, they could just shut it down, <laughs> and then there'd be no Siri. The, on the nice thing is, is chances are you know someone with an iPhone 4s. Well, maybe. Um, I mean, I was like the most like do. the, the <laughs> most Siri obsessed iPhone user makes like <laughs> half of the Siri requests to the server. Yeah. It's like, wow, this guy really likes Siri. <laughs> he makes a thousand requests every second. <laughs> but I mean, even even if you do have the auth token, you still have to install um, you, you know, an intermediary server to deal with the... Oh, with, it has to go through your own through server and then you go... It's just okay. a process that yeah. isn't really worth it, especially when it's there are other pain. voice action oriented programs for the yeah, iPhone, right? I mean, yeah, You can just use a different a really digital assistant that's not Siri... And it's just going to make your life a whole lot easier. Yeah, we just added those to the app directory for both Android and iPhone. And we did. Um, the, and I, I, I can't remember what we... Oh, we went with Siri for the iPhone. We went with Siri for the iPhone. But there, there were several it. really great... I mean, like, I have an iPhone 4, and I like using... What is it called? Vocal, uh, which is with a K. V-O-K-A-L. And it doesn't do everything Siri does, but there's another... Um, I think it's called Eevee. They're both in the, in the app directory post, and we'll post that in the show notes, but... Um, but they, the like, Eevee kind of handles uh, the the what you know what's two plus two at, uh, questions and Vocal will play your music library, <laughs> give you um, uh, let you send text messages and make phone calls kind of while you're in the car. So you can do everything with voice and the the voice recognition with that app is really really great. This also would be a good opportunity to plug the Lifehacker app directory, <laughs> yeah. which is at lifehacker.com slash apps. Um, it is our maintained and updated directory of the best applications and tools for computers, Windows, Mac, and Linux, and smartphones, Android, and iPhone. That's a very concise description. Thank you. Oh, it's almost nice. as though I read it off of the <laughs> intro to the post. Um, speaking of, just really briefly, to go off on a tangent, um, we, we just... Uh, we don't have a Windows Phone 7 user at Lifehacker currently, but we've been playing around with one lately, and I'd be curious if any readers are big Windows Phone 7 yeah. lovers. Um, because I, know, it would I do be, know that we have a few. I'm sure we do. Because um, be, I, I would like to eventually be able to add that to the app directory. Um, but but we, are, time, we are right as now, knowledgeable just, on it, and if it, it was we're getting one of you had more experience, it would... Well, we're, and we're getting another platform too. more, um, we're using it more. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But also, you know, not that many people use it. That's it. Um, yeah. But it is, it's a very nice operating system, so. If any of you want to help us out with that, let us know. Yes. <laughs> or if you just have an extreme demand and want to convince us that we need to tackle it. Email Ben. Okay, um, Brad writes in, Lately, all my friends have been building free NAS boxes for all their files. By the way, do you say, do you say free NAS or free NAS? I first seen it. NAS. Say free NAS. NAS. But only because I hang out with Dodges a lot, and he says NAS. NAS, NAS probably makes more sense, though, because it's not a Z. You know, I... But I'm okay with being wrong. I think I... I have a tendency I'm not, to say stop both. hanging out with you. Anyway, uh, <laughs> building free NAS boxes for all their files. They share all that data with their computers... Uh, which is very nice, but how do you get the most out of your FreeNAS setup and get programs working together as well? Uh, basically, Brad wants, for example, to be able to share the same iTunes or iPhoto library across several computers at once, um, but just in general, how, how, how to best use uh, the data on a NAS across yeah. several computers. So FreeNAS is awesome. I just built a FreeNAS box this summer, and I am in love with it. It's... Um, a really, really great way to, like you said, just share stuff between multiple computers or, or for a computer that's running all day if you want to, you know, be using BitTorrent, be seeding your torrents all day, especially if you're on a private track or you don't want to leave your desktop computer up. It's great for that. Um, FreeNAS 8 is the most recent version. I highly recommend you use FreeNAS 7 until FreeNAS 8 gets a little bit better. It's not really feature-filled at the moment. FreeNAS 7 actually has iTunes support built in. So you can just put your library in the FreeNAS box, uh, you know, check a box in the FreeNAS web interface, and you will be able to share that iTunes library with the computers on your network. Uh, iPhoto is a little bit more difficult. iPhoto and probably a lot of other Mac programs don't really have good network support like that. Um, the only thing I can think of for iPhoto off the top of my head would be to somehow use a, a sim link to tell all of your computers that... Uh, your iPhoto library is actually stored on this network drive. I don't know how well that would work. 
um, because I haven't done it myself, but that's a possibility. But, you, you know, free NAS supports iTunes out of the box. It's, can, can you not still um, set the location of your iPhoto library? Oh, can you do that? Well, it it's been a long be, time since I used iPhone. Oh, you can, yeah, you can. iPhoto with most of the iPhone like, Okay, so then you can actually manage options. multiple libraries that it used way. used to be yeah. you hold all, the Alt Option key and When you start it up, it's the same with iTunes. iTunes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do I have iPhoto? So. We can find out. The the way for the best way to use Green Eyes if it's you know it has iTunes support built in but if it doesn't have uh, built in support for a specific app you can just set up a shared yep. network drive and put all the but files you want on that yeah. you can you can have multiple libraries you can too. select what library Wonderful. you want to use but is there the same problem though uh, because I'm assuming the iTunes support in Free NAS helps with things like um, like uh, conflicts when like more than one person are opening at the same time is that do you know what I'm talking about? I don't know. I've never even tried to use it in a multi-person household before. Okay. This is my problem is I live by myself, so... Um, well, you're very helpful. I don't exactly sit there with my hands on two keyboards just singing what You're very <laughs> helpful. With I know. Them. I'm sorry. Um, but, but the nice thing about FreeNAS is, is that you can just set up a shared network drive with pretty much any files you want on it. Um, and then on either a Windows or a Mac uh, computer, set your computer to automatically mount that shared drive whenever you log on. So it's just like having an extra drive in that computer but it's an extra drive in all of your computers in your house. And I've done a full FreeNAS guide on how to set it up and how to uh, set up FreeNAS backup, which you can do with Time Machine or Windows Backup, um, you know, set it up with BitTorrent. So we'll put a link to that guide in the show notes, and that should definitely get you started. But you can put any files on, on a FreeNAS shared drive and use either you know, something like Simlinks or something like hitting Option when you start a photo to tell it where those files are stored, and that can give you access to that from all the in your house. I, I would, I'd like to add one thing, though. Just because you have such a high tolerance for pain when oh, you're dealing it, with your... You, you do make a good point. Free nice is a big pain in the ass. And... Well, well, it almost... I, I, As I look back, I wonder if it wouldn't have been easier to just install Linux or you know, install Ubuntu on this box and hook it up to a monitor to set it up. Because Free NAS, it doesn't have... It, it, all it has is a web interface. It can be very temperamental at times. It's it's BSD based, so even if you know Linux, you still kind of don't know half the terminal commands. You need to get things working, so it can be. It's basically like it's basically like managing a server. It is. Yeah. It is really it's like managing a, a server. And if you don't feel server. like managing a server, yeah. do yourself a favor. Just set up an Ubuntu box, yeah. stick it in the corner, unplug yeah. the monitor, and let it run all the time. Also, in this case, we're asking a Linux server to do a bunch of Mac stuff. And also true. And I was going to mention um, like time caps or something like that, but I don't think. Well, or, well, well here in in my in my situation, and I don't really do a lot of Mac stuff anymore. Um, I mean, in terms of serving up files, I serve up video that, and I have VLC player or Plex play it. But um, when uh, I mean, like I went and we 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 actually built the Hackintosh together. Yes. Um, that's running on my screen over there. And, the, and, I mean, that does all the server stuff, and it's just Mac OS X doing that. You're saying that you have that computer to do a lot of high-powered stuff because downloading mm. and transcoding takes a lot of... Yeah, but, in, but for a Mac user, if they're trying to serve up iPhoto and share all that stuff, it helps to run Mac OS X. You don't necessarily want to go buy, out and buy a Mac, so if you're willing to do the work, I mean, there's, yeah. I mean Hackintosh is really easy at this point. It's we have, easier than FreeNAS. We have a, like, between three and four hundred dollar build up right now, I think, on the always up-to-date Hackintosh mm -hmm. guide that you can use to build. It pretty much works out of the box, and you, using the Tony Mac stuff, you can install really easily, and then run Mac OS X, and then just use Mac OS X, just the regular Mac OS X as a server. Um, and so that's what I do. And, and just set it been, to never go to sleep, yeah. and you'll have access to those files all the time. Yeah. So that's worth looking into, too, if you yeah. are like an all-Mac household. There's no reason to... to Fucks with Linux or free BS or free NAS if it um, mm -hmm. if I you mean, just want to do something simple. I yeah. think I think though like you have your you have your free NAS to a place now where you love it, right? I do, and it's, it, it's if you're willing to put in the commitment and you've got it's very cool because I can it. manage everything from the web. That's the big advantage of free NAS is that I don't have to um, go plug in a monitor to the yeah. server computer or anything. I don't have to leave any of my high powered computers running all day and all night. Um, so it's very nice that I can just manage everything from a web interface yeah, on any true. of the computers in my house, or if I were to forward ports, which yeah. one day I might you do. You can only do it from home, yeah. because Witson <laughs> refuses to set up If I were to forward ports, port, then I could be, even be able to manage my NAS and, and download my torrents and whatever from out from you know my parents' house. To, or to be fair, you can do that on, on OS X or Windows or whatever, too. Right, right, right. 
I mean, right. that's that, there's there's just some extra stuff with. I mean, the whole you can manage all of. I mean, part of it though is it's super like energy efficient. Yeah. Like, they're really low yeah. power. Yeah. Super low power computer. Yeah. This computer my cost machine, me like no money. To be, I literally bought the right. cheapest parts I possibly could. Yeah, my machine is not made to. I mean, it's running a Core i five, so it's <laughs> not made to be. Low, my processor low was thirty dollars, and the guy at Fry's actually laughed at me when <laughs> I tried to buy it. Yeah, it was actually. I actually was like, "That's kind of mean." Yeah. All right. He can give you kind of a hard time. Reader Gaz writes, "Seeing all those fine workspaces out there with multiple screens makes me want to add some real estate to my laptop. I plug it into a 24-inch monitor already. How can I get it to two or three screens on a budget?" Well, Gaz, we've got bad news. Not all bad news. I'm you're not going to do it. So you're not going to do it on a budget. Um, well, it depends what he already has. But yeah, no, it is kind of probably kind of expensive. But anyway, why don't you kick us off? Uh, um, well, okay. For example, if you have one of these things, um, the MacBooks uh, with a Thunderbolt port, you can actually daisy chain displays with those. Um, I don't know if Apple's display does it, but I know there's like the Cinema View, which is a third-party display that costs, uh, I think, half half of what um, Apple's does, and allows you to hook up to. Um, or at least there's an adapter for it. Um, I'm pretty sure you can do that with any mini display port display. Oh, so I guess it, I wonder if it does matter with uh, Thunderbolt. I'm not, I'm not sure it does, but um, but so that you know that's an option there. In the um, in the case of not having that, you can get uh, USB displays. There's some little ones you can hook up. You can also do you can also get uh, USB uh, attachments that will let you hook up like a DVI display. Um, it usually won't work for for displays that are really big, but you can get probably a 1080p display on there, no problem. Um, and so that's probably your best bet. But on a budget, I mean, those things are usually around a hundred dollars. You're not gonna you're not gonna find a super cheap one of those. But then there's uh, you you were also talking about um, the the display sharing, the Air Display. Mm -hmm. um, you... So there's a there's an iPad app um, mm -hmm. called Air Display, and there's also so Air Display, you said it's on Mac. There, there's something yeah, there's a, the similar other... on Windows too, right? It's I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, don't I think wouldn't know if I were to do it. I would just I have multiple videos. I don't cards, know if so. it's necessarily the same. Anyway, <laughs> there, there are these applications that basically you run on your iPad or you run on an extra computer that you have that basically create uh, a new monitor on that computer, but it does it all sort of like over your network. It's not like plugged in. It's more of a... It's just a, like a networked, like streaming video type thing. It, it uses VNC. I was gonna say, it's probably, oh, yeah, it does. It's, yeah, so it's yeah. basically a remote desktop situation, but then it's like expands. It, it's honestly, I don't. But it looks, it looks like an, it looks like a second monitor. Right, it yeah, sets it up as a second monitor. It's but, fine for like IM. Yeah, I mean, like but it's also, it, you know, it's it's sort of. You won't be playing <laughs> Team Fortress Two no. on three monitors with this solution. <laughs> It'd be one thing with, um, you know, say you're using with an iPad and mm -hmm. you're, you're just using your iPad as a second monitor. And I think we've even posted specifically about yeah, how yeah, you use it to do that on the site. But um, yeah, it's that was one of my first post. <laughs> Mazel tov. <Okay. laughs> so, but it's basically like um, that's whatever. You've got an iPad there. It's that little extra ten inches or whatever mm -hmm. of, of screen real estate. Um, but like to run a second computer that's like fully booted up and running just so that you can like v display a, a remote yeah. desktop on it, it's kind of a it's not a great solution. No. And it's probably like, not going to be great for a low powered laptop either. It probably no. could slow things down. Oh yeah, that's the other thing is if you have a low powered laptop or any laptop really for the most part, how and much your yeah it's like if you're running that all through drive. the graphic card yeah if you're daisy chaining displays in any way. And then it's not gonna. I mean, your graphic card is gonna yeah. slow down. So you can or try do it, but the results might not be mm -hmm. satisfactory. And the only the only way to do it really, really properly is to have a P desktop uh, tower with multiple graphics cards. Yeah. Where you can just plug in as many DVI monitors yeah. as you but want. But there are options. I mean, you can at least get a second display. I mean, that shouldn't be a problem. I mean, obviously that's not a problem. I mean, well, you could do the three if you count your laptop as one display. Get a USB one and then do an external one from the laptop. You got three right there. So that's, let us know how it goes. That could be worse. Problem solved. Yeah. Moving on. Uh, Reader Ancor writes, "How can I get home and end key functionality in Mac OS X?" <laughs> so I'm assuming you're looking at uh, a keyboard like one on the MacBook Air I'm looking at right now, or one of the smaller keyboards because the the long ones with yeah. like the numpads have yeah. the home and end keys on them. Um, but you've got your options. 
Personally, I um, use the command key with the arrow keys pretty obsessively, the command and option key with the arrow keys to like select text and navigate uh, throughout a document. So straight up home and end stuff, um, command right is the same thing as end and command left is the same thing as home. Um, likewise, if you want to just go to the end of the document, you can do command down or top of the document, command up. Um, and those, they work like home and end almost, um, almost universally throughout the, the system. So that's one option. Another yeah. option you have... Oh yeah, it's, the, uh, it's just remapping the keys, because you've got an extra option in command key, and you probably aren't ambidextrous when it comes to choosing one side. So and caps you're... lock. Oh, and caps lock, yeah. Caps you have, lock. Yeah, you have keys you can, you can remap. Um, and there are keyboard remappers. I'm trying to think. I think it's uh, key, key remap, remap for MacBook, MacBook with yeah. The number four. Yeah, <laughs> and that should um, th th that can be a little difficult to edit. <laughs> that can be a little difficult to edit because you have to edit an XML file if you want to um, if you want to change specific keys. But because those are common, I'm pretty sure those are built into it. Those should be built right. Uh, in. Yeah. Um, so you just, just check, check off a box and it does it. And that was also in our app directory. Yes. Just last week, I believe. Mm. Oh, he's relevant. All questions. right, well, yeah. uh, Angor also wrote in with another great question. We are a group of friends, not him and us, but <laughs> I'm presuming he has a group of friends, yeah. planning to move into an apartment together. We need to find something that is almost equidistant to all of our workplaces. Is there a web app that would help us in something like this? I tried padmapper.com, which is pretty good, but it's not up to date all the time. Um, there's actually, I, I don't know specifically something geared exactly for this purpose. However, there's a really cool um, web app. It's very simple, like Google Maps mashup. It's called Meet In Between Us. It's Meet In Between Us. Meet In Between dot US. Um, and basically the purpose of the website is to, you give it two addresses, say like you want to meet a friend for drinks, um, but you live two hours away. And it gives you the equidistant point for you to meet up um, between you. And you can actually put in multiple addresses. So if you have, if you want to like head to meet in between us, put in the work address for you and however many roommates you uh, are looking to be living with. It will give you a pretty nice centered spot for what is going to be the most equidistant fair place to meet up or I guess to live in your situation. And then you can head to Padmapper and yeah. use that point and start finding places. Mm. I, f I found that Padmapper was very good at being up to date. Having just yeah. gone through the apartment search in the past two weeks, I love I Pad Mapper. It took We're, me a while. This is a Pad Mapper apartment right here. <laughs> yeah, I would not have found this place if it wasn't for Pad Mapper. So thank you, Pad Mapper. <laughs> but I do with zip code, so yeah, yeah it could vary based on that location. Very cool. But Pad Mapper, if you, we actually do have a high five for I think best apartment hunting tools. So oh, we yeah, can throw that in the show notes, and okay. if you don't like Pad Mapper, you can try some of those out. But in all of our experience, Pad Mapper is awesome. And so we recommend you stick Pad Mapper Plus. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Adam writes, I use a keyboard with my Windows computer, and it has a bunch of pre-assigned pre buttons built in. Um, basically, I think he means it, it has a bunch of sort of like extra non-default keyboard buttons built in. Some are useful, and others are useless, and already have keyboard shortcuts that he uses. Is there a way I can reassign those extra buttons to do something more useful? Back to remapping. <laughs> this is, I know, but this is a little bit different. So this isn't exactly key remapping um, in, in the strictest sense. This is something that would be more... Uh, is, would be better done with something like Auto Hotkey, which is one of our favorite uh, kind of keyboard scripting and shortcut creation applications. Um, a lot of it's going to depend on your keyboard. So I have a keyboard that is very much the same way, but instead of having separate buttons for like search and next track and things like that, it actually just uses the function keys and a function button. And my keyboard drivers allow me to swap um, what those do when I hit them. So I've just set it to swap the functionality so whenever I hit the play key, it plays iTunes or whatever, um, and I don't need to use the function key. I can reassign a lot of those functions within the program that came with my keyboard. And if Yours is a Logitech. Mine's a Logitech eliminated keyboard. If uh, So if you have a keyboard that has those buttons, you should have a driver that came with it and a program that can remap those. Sometimes it isn't that great and it doesn't have a ton of options. So what I do is because I was able to swap those function keys, I just use auto hotkey and we can link to our auto hotkey 
um, tutorial in the show mm -hmm. notes. And I can remap it to literally any function I want, from changing the volume to displaying an image or any. You can have it like launch it's, 13 applications if you want. Yeah, it's incredible. I, I have so I, literally every function key on the top of my keyboard is assigned to something awesome. Really? Yeah. Oh, tell awesome me some things. of them. Well, so I mean, the music things are just music things. And then I have a button that opens up my music player. Um, all my The three keys on this side, the, one of them turns my monitor off. One of them puts my monitor... Sorry, one of them puts up the screensaver. One of them turns my monitor off. And one of them puts my computer to sleep. Sounds so it's just a string of three buttons that I can, like... Because I don't like to shut off my computer all the way. Every time I hear about auto hotkey, I get jealous. Of oh, man. It is. It, if ever a program was going to keep me, you know, I came for something and I stayed for auto hotkey. That's I love it. <laughs> you came um, for something. I, yeah. I don't remember why I moved why. to Windows, yeah. but I did, and now yeah. auto hotkey has me hooked. Mm. Um, if you ha if your buttons are not the function keys, if they're separate buttons on your keyboard that your manufacturer has added, you can still use auto hotkey, but it's going to take a little bit more work. And I can link to auto hotkey's help page on this in the show notes too. It, um, you'll need to find the scan code for that particular button. When you press that button, your computer interprets it as a series of three numbers, I think. Um, and so once you, you can use a program to find that scan code and then plug that into AutoHotKey and tell it to do whatever you want with that button. Yeah. So again, the solution is AutoHotKey. It just takes a little bit more work. And we actually have a post, the post specifically that I did years ago that's like how to turn any action to a keyboard shortcut yep. using AutoHotKey um, that could get you, get you to the next steps after you've got your key codes. Right. Um, but yeah, auto hockey, it's incredible. It's, yeah. It's the thing I miss most not being when I'm not on Windows. Yeah. And you, and you can do, and you can do so many more advanced things with it too. Like our texter, like we were talking about earlier, the text expression program was written in auto hockey. Oh, video. And you could, yeah. yeah, and you could just, I mean, you can, if you're willing to code a little bit, it's a very easy language to learn and you can just kind of, the world is your oyster. There's this great GitHub repository if you're looking for like a, <laughs> you an auto hockey GitHub. project to take over. <laughs> GitHub.com slash Adam Pash. Um, okay, uh, so finally, Photo Eskimo writes, So me and my favorite girl live in a little town in Arizona called Flagstaff. He's got a whole story for us. It's a gorgeous town, and every time it snows, we find ourselves wishing we could capture the beauty. Our problem is our fear of damaging her new DSLR. We tried a number of ways to protect the device during heavy snow and rainfall, but we've never found a solution that completely puts these fears to rest. I've looked into waterproof casing and it's either far out of her price range or simply doesn't work. Is there a holy grail of DIY tricks that would allow us to capture our pretty, pretty snowfall that is both cheap and effective? Um, well, no. <laughs> no, I no say, moving on. No, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say there's a, a holy grail, but there are a lot of options. Um, one of which is condoms. We get to end the show with condoms. That's nice. Uh, My promise to you, we will always end the show <laughs> with condoms. That's a hefty claim. Uh, you know, well, for like a little camera, this works so much better with a little camera. If you just, if you double wrap your camera with condoms, um, then which we do not recommend doing in any other situation, it. you would use condoms. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then, then that will actually do a really good job with waterproofing. There's a knot you have to tie, I believe, too. Um, we will do this in the show notes. Um, we will have a link to all these things, but if you go to lifehacker.com slash, let's say, camera waterproofing, uh, we'll put all the nice little uh, options there, and you, can, uh, and, and you can check them out. There are a lot of DIY waterproofing uh, options that you have. They're just, uh, some of them might be a little bit more complicated than you want to do. I mean, really, the best thing you can do in this case, because you're working with such an expensive piece of equipment, because you don't want to be wrapping your DSLR in a condom, I don't think. Um, or, I mean, you don't need pretty, you? You need a pretty big condom. Hey, it's the it's the preferred waterproofing method of the Navy SEALs. Yeah, but look, look at that. That's you like can't, a, you can't tiny. argue with that. <laughs> that probably, I, that I looks... think it works better, most likely, with... Um, yeah, with your like point and shoots. Yeah, and you're also you're also dealing with like I mean you're not getting perfectly transparent latex. They're often colored at least yellow somewhat, which I don't really know. You could put it you could put it over all like but the lens. But the but the well, yeah, lines, you have to put it on the lens. You've spent a lot of money on this DSLR camera. Mm. It's probably worth spending a little more to get a good waterproofing solution. Yeah, but we'll post the DIY stuff so you can take a look, see if it actually will work for you. We'll try it. I mean, because you're not actually going underwater. So you don't. So the the uh, the protection doesn't have to be one hundred percent 
I mean, like 99% is probably. Right. I mean, in this case, it's probably. The real okay. mystery is how much does it snow in Flagstaff, Arizona? Yeah, I mean, I've, I used to oh, take out my DSLR and right. snow Flagstaff, it's very, it's very cold this time of year in Flagstaff. Yeah. Are you kidding? No. It's just, it's just like an hour or something um, below the Grand Canyon, which also gets cold this time of year. Today I learned. Mountains ish. Um, what's that one, um, what's the, what's the stuff that, um, does, like, the waterproofing of the iPhone? Oh, the like, liquid? The awesome one there's where you can just drop it I think the problem with that is because we're dealing with a camera sensor and removable lenses here, so that... I was just be, curious if that was something that I, I has ever been applied to... I don't know. I mean, I would guess that it's probably not a good option in this case, yeah. but, uh, but I also don't know what it's called. But if you're taking those exactly. pictures of snow with your iPhone... There is yeah. there is a, a waterproofing process you can get down on the phone. <laughs> yes, and we don't know what it's called, so that's it. But we will find <laughs> it and put it in the show notes. Next Maybe. time we'll all have laptops. Yeah. Okay. So well, that's that's everything for today. I that's guess. everything for this week. Mm-hmm. So if you want to ask a question, we do have yeah. two uh, two different ways for you to uh, do that. You can email us at tips plus ask life hacker at life hacker. Oh no, no, tips plus ask ask lh show. LH show. Tips plus LH show at lifehacker.com. Tips plus LH show at lifehacker.com. Or you can call oh. us 347 687 8109. Yeah, and so you can call. We've got a Google Voice account set up. Mm-hmm. Leave a message, and uh, next under, time you can hear your lovely voices instead mm-hmm. of having me read them. So that's once again 347 687 8109. Yeah, and if you if you do feel like actually appearing on the show with your pretty face, you can record a video and email it to us at tips plus ask LH show at lifehacker.com as well, and we will play that video too. Great. So that's so it. Thanks a lot. Yeah. That's it for next week. Yeah, soon? Yeah, yeah. super. That's it for this week, and we will see you next time. Later. <laughs>